soil health management systems, principles and practices. I, I'm gonna address some more of what was just brought up. And I wanna say, just keep the flow on, on chats, you know, any questions, any comments you have, any experiences that you wanna share with everybody, um, anything that you wanna share and get comments from me or from anybody else in the audience or in the room, um, feel free to put that in. I wanna keep this a, a good conversation back and forth so that we can really address what you need most. So first, how is it that soils degrade? I wanna get a little more in depth on that. Um, we've talked about tillage, tillage intensity as we increase tillage, as we decrease the amount of residue on the surface, as we decrease the diversity in the system, those practices tend to decrease the soil organic matter. They tend to increase erosion and compaction. And then as that happens, biological activity goes down, aggregate stability goes down. Doug Peterson talked a lot about aggregate stability. I'm gonna talk a lot about aggregate stability. It's a key indicator that you can see right out there in the field. Great for, for all those demos. At the very beginning of, of introducing practices, sort of our conventional agricultural practices, right? Till up the soil, only grow what we wanna be growing, keep the rest of the soil surface bare, right? That's how we've done agriculture for quite a while. It is really damaging to soil function. So we start decreasing our biological activity. That means our aggregate stability goes down because those aggregates are glued together by all the stuff that our microorganisms, our roots, our fungi put out into the soil as they are going about their business of living. As we lose that stability of those aggregates, we get crusting and surface compaction. And when that happens, as you saw in those demos, we decrease infiltration we decrease drainage, right? So you've got a sloppy mess on top. You've got dry soil underneath. The water's not going through. The dry, the, the wet sloppy mess on top is just wet with very little air in it. Not doing those plants any good, not doing those microbes any good, not doing your tractor any good as you're trying to get across. Not great for animals grazing because they're just gonna keep creating more of a sloppy mess, right? You have increased erosion because all that water is now going to run off the surface. So organic matter is lost even more. Nutrients end up being lost. You get less of that nutrient cycling because the, the microbial activity is going down. There's less organic matter there for those organisms to decompose and turn it to usable nutrients. You end up losing a lot of uh, topsoil. You get more ponding. And interestingly, you get less water storage, right? So kind of, it's kind of puzzling, right? You get more ponding, but you're storing less water. Wait, why is that? But if you think back to the demonstration that Doug just gave you with that puddle on the surface, right? That water wasn't even really going in. It's just sitting at the surface, making a muddy mess at the top. It's still dry underneath. And then when things dry out, the sun comes back out, that puddle dries up without that water ever actually making it in because the pores left between those Little pieces of sand, silt, and clay are so small that the water really can't get in. So all around, you, you get a lot of issues, right? So nutrient availability decreases. One of the things that happens in a sloppy, muddy mess at the surface is that you end up losing a lot of your nitrogen because it turns to nitrous oxide, which is a potent greenhouse gas, and just plain N2. So you're losing that nitrogen. It's no longer there for your crop. Um, Pests and disease tend to go up because plants tend to get stressed in those kinds of wet, low aeration kind of situations. And pests really take over when those diseases, when, when those uh, crops are stressed and diseases, a lot of them really thrive in that kind of overly wet condition. So then crop yields decline <laughs> and not so much in this country, but certainly in the developing world, hunger and malnutrition will increase because of that. So there's our spiral of soil degradation. It's a downward spiral. The more you, you practice with those conventional practices, the more that soil is degraded, the more you start seeing all of these impacts of those management practices, degrading soil function and really making agricultural operations riskier for the farmer and economically less viable. So, the productivity of conventional agricultural systems 
in this country tends to be maintained by increased use of technology, increased labor, increased fuel, increased nutrient inputs, pesticide inputs, water inputs, right? There are farmers who had to put in an irrigation system once their soils degraded so much that they couldn't really make it without them anymore. Um, a lot of farmers have said, yeah, you know, it just seems like my yields, <laughs> I, can, I can keep them stable as long as I keep buying more and more pesticides and herbicides and, and nutrients. We've really seen that. Now, how do we turn it around? First, we have to recognize the issue is there, right? So general signs of poor soil health, some of which we've talked about already, right? If we're seeing hard soil compaction, if we stick a shovel in the ground and we see this kind of structure with, with plates that are parallel to the surface, we know we've got a compaction issue. And that happens in really degraded pastures too. For all of those <laughs> working with beef pastures, um, pastures can be a great way to manage for healthier soils if you do it right, and they can be very destructive if you don't do it right. I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, crusting, right, puddling <laughs> at the surface, driving through a field and getting ruts, um, digging up big clods like this, right? Those are all signs. If you walk out there and your crop leaves are discolored, it may be a soil health issue. Um, signs of runoff and erosion, poor growth of plants. You know, if, if your plants are big in some places and really small in other places, probably some of what's at stake there is that there's soil degradation going on and that is more strongly coming out in some parts of the field than others. So what do we do about it? Um, NRCS pulled together four nationally applicable soil health principles that can serve the soil ecosystem. And those four principles are applicable across the whole country, but when the rubber hits the road and you actually go to manage in a particular production system, those principles have to be adapted to that production system with the practices that are appropriate for that system. Um, these principles apply to grazing situations as well as crop situations. Just how do we apply them is what we need to figure out. Um, the other thing I'm going to say is you're going to encounter the soil health principles in various places, and you're going to have people say, nope, there's five, because integrate livestock is critical. And I totally agree that wherever it is possible to integrate livestock back into our crop systems, that increases diversity. And so it's a great way to improve soil health, to integrate animals back into those systems, to go back and forth between producing crop plants and grazing animals on perennials. That's fantastic. It's not an option for every single producer. And there are ways to build healthy soils without integrate, <laughs> integrating animals directly. You can do it with a lot of good cover cropping. You can do it with other perennials. You can import compost that may or may not be related to animals, right? Um, and so in terms of nationally applicable soil health principles, these four minimize disturbance, maximize soil cover, <laughs> biodiversity, and continuous living roots. Those four, uh, four are broadly applicable. And integrate livestock goes in with biodiversity. Now there's another principle that you'll, you'll maybe encounter out there. Um, some other groups have picked this up. It totally makes sense. Um, and that's consider the context, right? And that's really what I was talking about there. These four principles apply everywhere. When you go to actually use them on a farm, you have to look at the context of what that farmer is doing, what their production system is, what their equipment is like, what their mindset is like, what kind of resources they have, what kind of support they have in their community to start getting them on the road to healthier soils. Also, all of these soil health principles need to be adapted to each other <laughs> and the use of technology, nutrients, pest management approaches, and the unique production system, soil, climate, farmer, rancher, all of that all have to be integrated into a system. So then that system, what is a soil health management system? That's basically a collection of management practices that addresses all four of those soil health management principles in order to improve or regenerate soil health and then maintain it at a much higher functioning level. So again, those principles apply to all production systems, but have to be adjusted. Um, so specific combinations of those practices have to be 
adapted to particular production systems, right? If you're growing strawberries, it's going to look very different from when you are a beef producer. And we will talk a bit about the various practices that can be applied and how it is that we might do that just at a, at a general level to give you a basic understanding. But I want to acknowledge right here that there's a lot to it. And each situation will be different. And you will want to build a network of support resources around your community that you can connect farmers with. Because if your specialty is not going out on the farm and providing that technical assistance yourself, then what you want to be able to do is inspire that producer to want to learn more and then give them the resources, point them to the right contacts who can help them get to soil health management systems. <clears throat> so I'm gonna give you an example of the soil health management systems principles at work. Um, with aerial photography, we have come to be able to see fields in a way that farmers long ago never used to be able to, and that is from above. And so I want to point you to this field here and see that dark green line? It doesn't look like it's part of the soil features, right? There's, there's often in fields a lot of variability. It often tends to be related to how the water flows, slight differences, but here's this very straight line. And what that is, is a fence row that got taken out some time ago. But that fence row still has much better soil health and therefore you can see that in the crop. Now what's going on here? A fence row, if you think about it, meets all four soil health management systems principles. It gets very low disturbance. It tends to be more biodiverse. It tends to have living roots in the soil year round. The soil tends to be covered year round. That kind of system builds soil aggregates, builds that pore space, builds nutrient cycling, builds soil organic matter. And the result is a much more resilient crop. And you see examples like this all across the country. Now, we can take those principles to work across a whole field if we manage a whole field with soil health management systems principles. So here's an example of a cornfield on the left side with soil health management systems principles all in place, no-till, cover cropping, additional crops integrated, and then to the right is a conventionally managed field. And all of that very light green that you see, there's been a lot of rainfall and that nitrogen has left the system. There was a lot of denitrification from it becoming muddy and low, you know, low air content, not enough aeration. So you get this kind of much, much lower productivity from that kind of system. So we see it, we see it in a lot of different systems. Now, one of the ways that I have enjoyed talking to farmers, and here we come back to this idea of creating a paradigm shift, creating those aha moments. I think you all are in a position where you can capture somebody's attention. You can create that awareness that is needed to first get somebody started on adopting new practices. And one of the ways to do that is to talk about how soil function is driven by all those organisms, those billions of organisms. <laughs> Remember a handful of soil has more organisms in it than there are people on earth and those organisms are at work for us and for the production system and for the economic resilience of that farm. And those organisms need us to protect their home so that they have the structure, the water, the air, the food that's there. And they need us to feed them a diverse year round diet including energy and nutrients. So if you think of corn, corn, corn for, you know, May to October, and then there's nothing, right? That's not a very diverse or very consistent diet for those microbes. That's why we like to make sure to maximize living roots in the system, because that's how all those organisms get fed. Now, one of the ways to talk about that, a lot of you are working with producers who are already livestock producers. They know what they would do for their cattle, right? And so you can say, you know, you're, you're a livestock producer, but you didn't know you actually have way more than cattle. You actually have a herd of microscopic livestock that are making your farm viable. Those producers who are crop producers, you can tell them, yeah, bet you didn't know it, but you're actually a livestock producer. 
You've got billions of livestock on your farm. Now, what do you need to do to help them be successful? What do you need to do to help them thrive? Well, you need to protect their home and you need to feed them. The soil health management systems principles are all about achieving those two things. Maximizing living roots and maximizing diversity is about feeding diverse continuous inputs, carbon sources, energy, and nutrients to those organisms. When we feed them with plenty of diverse food sources, whether those are the roots, whether those are manures, compost, um, biochar, other, you know, inoculating plants so that they do what they need to do, right? All of that diversity helps them get that diverse diet that they need. That stimulates diversity below ground. It breaks disease cycles. It increases soil organic matter and nutrient cycling. It enhances plant growth. It increases beneficial organisms in that soil so that there's less likelihood of pests and diseases taking over a field and knocking out a whole crop. Protecting habitat, right? That's the other really important piece. And we mostly achieve that through minimizing disturbance and maximizing soil cover, right? We're, we're putting a roof on the soil. We're keeping it covered to protect it. That protects the aggregates that are so very important as you all have now seen. It protects the structure of the soil to make sure that we get that good infiltration when the raindrop first hits the surface of the soil, or ideally when the raindrop hits a leaf or a piece of residue and then slowly runs around that, right? If we can avoid that really high pounding impact of a drop of rain on those little particles of sand, silt, and clay, they're all glued together, right? If we can avoid that impact, but just have the raindrop impact a piece of plant material, live or not, you know, and have it get down into the soil from there then we have protected the surface of that soil, allowing that whole structure to stay in place nicely. Protecting habitat allows for a balance of water and air in those pore spaces, allows for a balance of temperature, especially in the Southeast. This is particularly relevant. You know, when we were talking to folks in the Northeast, it's maybe a little less relevant, doesn't tend to get us hot. But in your all's climate, with the kind of heat that you experience during the summer months. If you imagine bare soil, that sun hitting that bare soil causes intense increases in temperature of that soil. If you take a thermometer out there on a hot summer's day, this might be another good demonstration. Hot summer's day, you go out there to a farm, you take a little pocket thermometer out, you stick it in the ground where there's bare soil, you stick it in the ground where there's growing grass or a growing cover crop. What you're going to see is that under that cover crop, that soil temperature is going to be a nice balmy, whatever, close to the air temperature or a little cooler because it's shaded. It's got some moisture right at the surface. It is well protected. If you stick that thermometer into bare soil with nothing on it, you might get temperatures 100, 120, 140, 150. Those are not temperatures that either plant roots or plant microbes are comfortable with. And so one of the reasons to maximize soil cover <laughs> is to achieve that kind of temperature balance. And it particularly matters. Plants don't do particularly well when they get too hot. When their roots get too hot, they kind of shut down and go into survival mode instead of really thriving. So one more reason to, uh, to manage for healthy soils. So we want to agrade our soils or regenerate our soils. And a little bit about, you know, we can, we can talk about that being a, a climb of a staircase, right? Where we first increase biological activity because now we're protecting their home, we're feeding them plenty of food year round. As that biological activity goes up, we're gonna have more organic matter turnover and more organic matter sequestration as those aggregates build up. And as those aggregates protect organic matter inside of them, that means we get improved nutrient cycling. These these steps right here, those first three <laughs> are not generally very visible. They're happening. But then as you really start to improve soil structure and improve water availability, now you can really start to see the impact of that regeneration of soil function. So looking at those principles, right, protecting that protecting that habitat for our organisms. What practices do we wanna use for that to protect below ground livestock? 
what functions do we want to achieve there, right? Maintaining soil organic matter and aggregates, reducing erosion, runoff, buffering temperature, reducing evaporation, all of those benefits. Minimizing disturbance means that we are physically, chemically, and biologically trying to minimize disturbance to that natural ecosystem that we are now managing as, as you know, we are part of that ecosystem, right? We, we are managing those processes on that land, but we know how nature does things. When you go into a forest, if it, if it was, if it grew itself, it was, if it wasn't planted by people, right? You see a lot of different layers of species. You see that generally the soil is covered. <laughs> you see that there's living stuff all around the year. Right, all of the principles are there in a natural system, and so we're trying to emulate that in these agricultural systems that we're trying to build up to be regenerative systems. Um, so when we're talking about physical disturbance, the things that people bring in, right, tillage, grazing compaction, heavy equipment, um, overgrazing, especially in wet situations, all of those are physical disturbances, and soils are much more vulnerable to being compacted when they're wet and so particularly when you get those really big rainstorms that you often get in the southeast that's not the time to go in the field whether you're plowing it whether you're grazing it you want to be able to protect that soil when it's particularly wet but when you have a healthy soil it's more likely to be able to take it because it's going to drain fast it's going to get back to what we call field capacity which is kind of that ideal moisture where it's not squishy wet and muddy it'll get back to that much more quickly because of that good aggregation. Chemical disturbances, right? Fertilizers, pesticides, some soil amendments, if they're poorly applied, um, they can certainly do some damage. And so we wanna be aware of that. Um, biological disturbances, right? <laughs> grazing when it's overgrazing. If you continue to take the tops off of perennial grass and you do it over and over again, and just as it's starting to put some young new shoots up again, you graze it off again, right? cattle really like the fresh green stuff. If cattle have a choice, they're going to go for the much more young, recent succulent grass rather than the stuff that's been growing for a few months. If you are in a continuous grazing kind of situation and those cattle have free roam of the entire pasture, they're going to keep coming back to the best young stuff, which means they're going to knock back those grasses that you really want to give a chance to to grow all the way back up so that they can grow a full root system again. If they don't have a chance to put on enough of the new shoots, then they're not able to capture that sunlight energy to put more of that carbon below the ground, put more of that carbon into their into their roots, right? So that's a biological disturbance. Um, fallow systems, monocultures, um, there's various different ways of thinking about um, how our management disturbs biological cycles that are normal in natural systems. And, you know, we're, we're humans, we need to grow our food and everything else. And so we, we are going to cause some disturbances and we could have philosophical dis discussions about that. But in terms of this principle, we want to minimize those disturbances wherever we can and to work with nature, work with our land, right, to, to build up that function. Some of the effects of excessive or chronic disturbance are you know, really all the ones that we've been talking about this morning. Um, the quality of that habitat for organisms, soil structure is being lost, et cetera. So what are some of the practices for minimizing disturbance? Um, to those of you who are familiar with NRCS, you will recognize these numbers. They are practice codes. Um, when you work with producers that also have equip contracts with NRCS, they may be familiar with those codes. They're basically numbers assigned to the particular practices. Each of those practices has a practice standard that's published online that tends to be revised every five years. Um, and it, it is sort of adjusted to, the, to be a national standard for what is required to fully meet um, all of the requirements for that practice in a way that addresses the resource concerns as identified by NRCS. So that information, a lot more in depth, is available online. For those of you who are not familiar with NRCS practice codes, all that, you can just ignore those numbers for now. We'll talk briefly about each of those practices um, and a little bit about how they minimize disturbance, right? So reduced tillage 
and no tillage are under residue and tillage management. That's what the practice standard is called, um, basically because when you reduce tillage, you have more residue at the surface. Um, conservation cover, any way to cover that soil so that we can reduce disturbance. Um, nutrient management, a chemical disturbance, right? We, <laughs> we can adapt management to the system so that we're not creating disturbances like overloading on nutrients. Integrated pest management, really working on all the various ways that we manage the various pests in a way that minimizes those chemical disturbances. And then prescribed grazing. I've been talking a little bit about grazing here and prescribed grazing is the standard that NRCS uses um, for, for helping uh, folks like the beef producers you work with adjust their grazing systems so that we can build healthier soils rather than degrading those soils. Um, in terms of a disturbance, right? This, this little graph, I don't know how, <laughs> how well you can see that. Um, soils respire, right? All those microbes are in the soil and they are breathing in oxygen and they are breathing out CO2 just like we do. And when you till, you get a big spike of respiration where you're losing a lot of carbon. And then generally respiration goes down to a much lower level. Whereas in a no-till system or a reduced till system, you tend to have a much more even uh, respiration over the course of the year. And in general, you tend to lose less carbon, but you have a more sort of continued activity of those organisms because they're in a much better habitat for them. Okay, so why maximize soil cover? If we talked about some of these aspects before, but decreasing erosion is a big piece, right? If we're covering that surface, that raindrop hits, it, if it hits a leaf or a piece of residue, it's not gonna do the same damage, right? You saw Doug show those side-by-side -side containers and, and talking about you know, this, this muddy soil here. When he was moving it just a little bit, a lot more soil was falling off of it. And that was just a very small way of demonstrating something that in the field, you know, those raindrops hit and everything just falls apart when you have aggregates that are not stable. Um, soil cover, even on degraded soils, if you have more residue on a degraded soil, because it protects the surface, because it protects whatever pores are still open at the surface, that residue can help maintain some level of infiltration. Much better if you have a highly functioning, well aggregated soil beneath that residue, and that's what you build up partially by, by keeping the soil covered in one way or other. Ideally, you're, you're keeping it covered with living plants for as much of the year as you possibly can, because that means that the roots are also adding carbon to the soil and they're building up those aggregates in collaboration with all those microorganisms. We just talked a bit about reduced evaporation, right? In terms of water, if we get a big rainfall, but then we don't have any more rain for a couple of weeks, if you can infiltrate all that water and then your surface is covered, it doesn't get too hot, that means you're not evaporating all that water. Ideally, we would pass all of the water that's in the soil through the plant, not past the plant, right? We want our plants to have use of that water, especially in some of those hot summer months when sometimes we're lacking rain. We want the water to go through the plant to do its job and then be evapotranspired out the leaves instead of evaporating off the surface of the soil. If that soil is covered with a nice roof that shades it, and maybe even with some leaves that are evapotranspiring, putting moisture into the air, keeping it cool, we're gonna get much less evaporation and much less of a really hot temperature that um, makes it pretty hard for our plants to, to thrive. And then of course, habitat for the soil organisms, right? We, we want that soil cover. It feeds organisms at the surface. Some, some organisms, some of the various shredders, various invertebrates that live in the soil, earthworms, they all like to pull that stuff into the soil. <laughs> we wanna be able to feed them. So it's food for our biota, for, for all of the living organisms that are there. And when we have surface cover, it also tends to mitigate compaction from either machines or livestock. Especially if that cover is living plants, it tends to really help minimize compaction. If that cover is just residue, it's still better than not having that there in terms of getting onto the field. So 
Those are all good reasons to maximize soil cover as part of protecting that habitat. So what practices do we use for that? Again, you're gonna see some similar ones, right? Cover crops, cover crops are good for everything. You're gonna hear about cover crops over and over again. And one of the both challenges and opportunities in the Southeast is you have a fantastically long growing season year round. So there's much more opportunity for cover crops. On the other hand, you might be using that for cash crops. And so, well, maybe you don't have as much of an opportunity to integrate cover crops, right? And that all depends on the production system. But one thing about cover crops, you know, they're, they're chosen to achieve particularly useful aspects of building your soil. But cash crops, cover crops, they're all crops, right? They're all plants that are sequestering carbon, putting it down into the soil. If you are growing cash crops year round in a way that maintains that soil cover, that also contributes to putting carbon in the ground. Now, if it's a really disturbing cover crop, if it's one that doesn't create much biomass, if you're digging up potatoes or carrots, then, then yeah, there's gonna be a lot of disturbance with that. And so coming up with some ways to <laughs> reduce that disturbance, to maximize that cover, you know, sometimes in vegetable uh, systems, you might end up using mulches because it's harder to grow those cover crops on site. So you might grow a cover crop elsewhere where it improves the soil and then harvest some of it and use it as a mulch. That's one option that has been used in vegetable systems. Lots of different ways to think creatively about how you might adapt something. But cover crop is a good one keeping, for keeping soil cover. Um, again, no-till, reduced till um, keeps more of the residue on the surface instead of tilling it down under conservation cover. Mulching, especially in small scale vegetable type operations, mulching is a really effective way to keep the soil covered. Um, controlled traffic, you know, for, for larger operations, making sure that the wheels are always in the same spot so that you're getting that compaction and the kind of mushing in of whatever's on the surface just in those, in those spots where the wheels cross, but leaving everything else not disturbed um, is, can be one good approach. And then for grazing situations, forage and biomass planting that really addresses getting good soil cover, good growth, um, good productivity, and again, pre prescribed grazing. Now, looking at the feeding side of the principles, right? Maximizing living roots, maximizing diversity. What practices do we use? Why are those important? So in terms of maximizing the presence of living roots, how do we do it? What are the practices? Um, growing cover crops or um, other crops in the off season, right? Making sure that there's plants in the system for as much of the year as you possibly can. And again, I'll come back to the point of some of my colleagues that are out there, you know, talking enthusiastically about soil health and helping a lot of producers change, right? If you remember one thing about the principles and you can't quite hold on to all four of them, remember living plants year round, and then that'll probably help you, help you remember all the other ones. <laughs> we wanna really maximize the presence of those living roots because that's how carbon gets into the ground. That's how we feed all those organisms in a natural system. And so we wanna emulate that as much as we can given the system that we have at hand. And there are gonna be some challenges and often we can come up with creative ways to, um, to tweak the system or to totally change it in a direction that achieves this. Um, increasing the time in perennial crops when that's an option. For all those of you working with beef grazing type operations, maybe they're fully perennial. And so at that point, it's a matter of, okay, how do we maximize the presence of living and thriving roots in that grazed system, right? Because when you have a grazed system, you've got perennials year round, if it's that kind of system, or you might have a producer that um, rotates back and forth between annual crops and grazing. That's another situation and, and that can be good. But if you have land that is fully perennial grasses and forbs. You want to increase the diversity in those. You want to give them the time to fully regrow, fully rebuild their roots. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, but increasing the time of perennial crops, wherever that can be done, is great when you have the ability to have animals in the system because animals actually really help build up soil health when managed appropriately. And that's one of those interesting things. I think there's a lot of flack that animals uh, agriculture has gotten because of the way that we are largely doing that across the United States. But grazing animals can really help build up soil health when you do it right. 
just the key is you have to understand some of the dynamics, you have to understand how soil health works, and you have to understand how it is that you can change that management of those grazed animals in a way that really helps the plants thrive and feed those animals better. Um, managing rotations, intercrop mixtures, uh, managing the forage height, all of those tend to help in terms of maximizing the presence and the, the thriving nature of really good living roots. You know, you want a diversity of roots. You want some that go all the way down deep. You want some fibrous roots that really go all throughout the surface. If you've ever dug up different cover crops or different pasture plants, you'll know that some of them have long tap roots that can really help <laughs> with infiltration deep down into the soil. You'll know that some of the grasses have very fibrous roots. They're really just in the top six inches, but they're fine and there's lots of them and they're really helping build those aggregates and all of those kinds of roots are really helpful and if we've got a mixture of all those different roots then they're using the resources in that soil differently and they're all helping build the soil in different ways. So again similar practices right some of these practices you will see in every single one of the principles and some of them are kind of unique to one or two or three. Um, conservation crop rotation, conservation cover, cover crop, forage and biomass planting, prescribed grazing, they're all important parts to, pre to preserving the presence of living roots. So then finally, maximizing biodiversity. How do we do it? What practices can we use? Um, how growing diverse cover crops and legumes in, in rotation, you really want to have a diversity of crops in any system. If you can possibly add more crops, tends to be a good thing. If you can grow crops together where their roots are, are growing together in the same place, that can be even better in terms of the total biomass that you can get. <laughs> and that is more possible for some systems than for others. You know, one of the things that I like to say sometimes is, you know, corn originally was intercropped. Corn grew with beans. Fantastic human feed actually makes really great silage too, right? It's not something that is standard to use right now, but I sure hope that uh, a lot of folks consider that that might be something to go back to um, because it was a really effective way to bring in nitrogen from the air instead of having to manufacture nitrogen fertilizer and make that whole system much more efficient, much higher quality feed. Um, integrating livestock, really getting them back into our systems. One opportunity for cover crops, you know, sometimes the argument of somebody growing in, in a southern climate like yours where you could grow cash crops year round, right? Somebody might say, well, I just can't afford to grow a cover crop because I want to be making money off of that land. But also that can be very degrading depending on what kind of cash crops you're growing. But if you have the opportunity to graze livestock on those cover crops, it can allow us the ability to rest those pastures, those perennial pastures that we have so that they can recuperate, they can really fully grow back have more better feed available, and we can graze those cover crops and get economic benefit from those. And that's really, if managed well, just as good as growing a cover crop, because when you're grazing that cover crop, the, the cows take off some of the carbon and some of those nutrients, but most of that organic matter and those nutrients go back down on the soil in a much more digestible form for those organisms. And so you actually end up increasing nutrient cycling and increasing carbon cycling in that soil when you're bringing livestock onto that land to graze those cover crops. Um, it can also be an effective way to manage a cover crop, like for example, an organic operation that grows the kind of cover crop, like for example, cereal rye, that once it heads, once it makes seed that's not fully viable yet, if you graze it off, it's not going to grow back. So that can be one effective way to terminate a cover crop. So lots of options if you understand how the different plants work. Um, one of the tools that isn't quite available yet for the Southeast, but that is in development, is a cover crop decision support tool. There is a, South, a, a Southern Cover Crop Council. Some of you may be familiar with it. Uh, if not, we can provide a link to them. Right now, they mostly have <laughs> fact sheets and, and such resources available on the website. Um, but a decision support tool is in development that would help a farmer um, put in their information about when they have potential cover crop windows and what 
um, what they're looking to achieve with those cover crops and, and can make an impact there um, by choosing the right cover crop and managing it in the right way. So again, what practices for maximizing biodiversity, conservation crop rotation, right? Having more crops that are in that rotation, um, conservation cover, cover crops of various different sorts, forage and biomass planting, um, integrative pest management, prescribed grazing, and a new one. Um, while I was still with the Soil Health Division at NRCS, we incorporated the Soil Carbon Amendment interim practice standard. It was 808 for those of you who may have heard of that. Um, it is coming out to the Federal Register, I think shortly, um, and it will be Soil Carbon Amendment 336. So if you haven't heard of that standard yet, that one is specifically to allow for applying compost, biochar, and other organic soil amendments for the purpose of improving soil health. And so again, for small operations, for vegetable operations, it's gonna be a really key one. So that's management with the principles. Just a couple of pictures here to, to talk about some of these more. You know, Here's a, a friend and colleague of mine in New Hampshire, roller crimping a, a cereal rye cover crop that got nice and tall, planting straight into it. He's been experimenting a lot with that on an organic uh, farm. Um, this is an interseeder that can allow for both side dressing and interseeding of cover crops so that you can get a cover crop established inside of a growing corn crop. Um, I think there's work being done of this sort in, co <laughs> in cotton production systems as well. Um, a nice cover crop mix here of triticale and winter peas, zone tillage equipment and what that looks like and some grazing cows. In terms of grazing, you know, again, poor pasture management can really damage soil health, right? It can lead to uneven fertility, to poor productivity, to weeds, um, poor quality of pasture species, and therefore less feed for those animals, compaction and erosion problems. But when you manage pastures well with rotational grazing, where you fence off with electric fence, a whole bunch of small paddocks, and you move the animals from one to the next over time, when you do that, it allows for everything to be grazed off rather than just a few selected species. So that prevents some of the issues with weeds, for example. Um, animals are in a paddock for a shorter amount of time. So there's less damage to the soil. They don't eat the, the uh, growing crops down quite as much. They trample some of the feed and then they get moved to the next paddock. And now this first paddock that was in use um, gets a chance to, to regrow <laughs> and regrow to fully, um, to fully grow all the feed that, that it can grow. And so you get a lot more productivity when you have a system that moves cattle from paddock to paddock. There's a lot of experimentation with that going on. There are a lot of really successful producers who are using this kind of system and using it with something called mob grazing, where they really pack a lot of animals into a small paddock for a very short amount of time, sometimes even moving their cattle several times a day through small paddocks. And people are seeing a lot higher productivity um, and doing things that way really gives the, the ability for diverse species to regrow all the way after grazing so that there's a full rest period. It distributes the manure better across those paddocks. It, uh, it allows for better nutrient cycling. It gets the soils to be better aerated, gets us better aggregation. It alleviates and prevents further compaction because you can manage wet conditions much better. You can have a sacrifice paddock where you put your animals there whenever it's too wet to put them on your, on your pasture land. And also you get more resilient soils that are more able to carry animals right after some rain because they drain better. Um, and Indications are right now, it may actually be quite possible to not only have beef production be climate neutral, but better than that with soil health practices. It's just that we have to do it right. We have to be really building soil carbon as we're grazing animals and not using lots of nitrogen fertilizer on poorly managed, poor, you know, unhealthy soils that are growing a corn crop. Um, and so it looks like there's a lot of potential for that to happen. So Exciting news for, for grazing. It, really, grazing systems can be managed to really improve soil health. So what we're all trying to achieve here is win-win soil health management systems. We want them to be commonplace. I'd love to see this be the new conventional agriculture. 
and you can see we can we can turn that whole spiral around that we looked at in the beginning right we can use our principles of soil health management and we can rebuild those aggregates we can increase our soil organic matter and rooting we can reduce compaction we can increase infiltration and wind and water erosion will decrease as a result <laughs> we'll get more plant available water our crops will grow better we'll get even more soil organic carbon nutrients we'll rebuild our topsoils and then we need less energy less tillage fewer inputs we'll have lower disease pressure so we need fewer pesticides and, and herbicides we'll have more water and nutrient access so again fewer inputs needed get better rooting better soil organism diversity field conditions improve we have much greater resiliency and so we get better yields and quality and lower cost risk and environmental impact so that's the spiral we want right we want that upward spiral we really want to bring producers onto the path of doing that and just a, an insight here you know when you do that on protected land we're able to much more capture that long-term function because that land isn't going to get developed so what better place to help producers put these practices in place than protected land that's always going to be agriculture because any carbon we sequester there it's going to stay there that land isn't going to turn into massively more impactful developed land so it's a good place to really build our resilience in our agriculture okay so taking it back um, i'm realizing we have yet to get into barriers but i want to take a moment and stop here and see if anybody's got questions key concepts that are sticking with you um, anything in particular that has surprised you about practices um, Bianca, there were a couple of questions in the chat earlier. You sort of lightly touched on them, but um, there were a couple relating to cover crops. One, which was how do you recommend termination of, co of cover crops? And then a follow-up question was, could livestock be used to terminate cover crops? You talked about livestock grazing, but not clear whether that is like a termination strategy. So can you speak to whether livestock could be used for that or what are the other ways to terminate cover crops? Yes. Um, basically the three ways, there might be more, three major ways that cover crops get terminated. One is herbicide. One is some kind of physical disturbance, whether you roll or crimp the cover crop or whether you actually mow it or till it in right some kind of physical activity or grazing it um, all of those can work it has to be adapted to the cover crop and the timing um, some cover crops will regrow after they're grazed or mowed and some cover crops if you get them at just the right time will not do that so for example cereal rye is probably the most commonly used cover crop if it is still in the leafy growth stage if it hasn't made a head of grain yet then if you graze it it will continue to grow so you can get some really good feed off of it and then it can continue to grow and go all the way to grain or you can terminate it in some other way or if you graze it once it's already made a head but not with viable grain yet if you graze it at that point that will terminate it because cereal rye will not continue to grow after you do that um, similarly, if you roll or crimp cereal rye, um, same thing. If you do that at just the right stage, it will crimp the stem and therefore it won't be able to grow anymore. And then, of course, there's herbicide termination ways. Um, you can till in a cover crop, but then you've got that physical disturbance. Um, <laughs> it is probably the most common way to terminate a cover crop in organic systems. And that's one of the tricky aspects of organic systems is that there's that tillage, but if you're if you're putting a lot of organic matter into the system, you can often avert some of the damage from that physical disturbance. And when that soil is really well aggregated, really well stuck together, um, a simple tillage event isn't going to have as big an impact as it will in a system that doesn't have well built up aggregates, but trying to reduce that. Um, did I fully address the, the cover crop termination question there? Uh, I think so. Yes. To if people have more questions, feel free to continue putting them in the chat. The other question, which was a grazing specific question, again, you touched on it a little bit, but question is when grazing, should we attempt to reduce the plant going to reproductive state? That's a question for a grazing expert. Right. I, okay. I don't actually know. 
in the grazing schools that I went to in Kentucky, you know, they always stress to try and graze the uh, paddock no more than four or five days because then it would start to, re you know, you'd get them, get the cattle off before they start growing the new shoots. And then we were trying to rest uh, three or four weeks before we ever came, at least as a minimum, before we came back to that paddock. And so uh, I don't remember ever talking about the reproduction reproductive stage of the of the of the grass in that four weeks but I think in most places the grass would maybe make a seed head as it recovered because you're staying off you're staying off as long as possible so I don't think the reproductive stage was something they told us to stay away from well then I will go on to our last section on some barriers to soil health adoption I am going to just introduce this topic but you all are in luck. Um, Michelle Perez, our water initiative specialist has done amazing work on soil health economic case studies and she and team are gonna present later today. So they will get a lot more into the economics, but I wanted to kind of set the stage and provide a little bit of an overview of what some of the barriers to soil health adoption are. Um, adopting soil health practices really requires not only an understanding of the physical resources and production system, but there are social and economic considerations, right? People are part of their community. Farmers have done things certain ways for a long time. There are good reasons why things are done the way that they are. And so when, when we as, as people in the space of wanting to create positive change, start to interact with those producers, one of the most important pieces of that is to really understand where they're at right now and help them ask questions and gain an interest and not pushing them to somewhere where they're not comfortable, but helping share perspectives that may help and that may, cre <laughs> that may create some of those aha moments. Awareness and understanding of key human social and economic considerations can really help with implementation and with long-term adoption. And we need to pair that with the technical resources because a lot of soil health adoption is really technically understanding the soils and the crops and the animals and how all those interact to create better soils. But really understanding how the social and economic aspects play into that is a key important piece. So when we discuss this in a little bit, I'd love to hear about what your current perception of soil health is in your region. If you, if you think that most people know about it, are a little bit interested, or most people really have no clue about it yet, um, whether people tend to have a lot of hesitancy about it, whether you're seeing excitement happening, whether there are particular obstacles that you're seeing in the systems that you're in. Um, when it comes to adoption, um, a lot of folks have sort of in the social science literature studied this and what tends to happen is with anything, you know, whether we're talking about soil health adoption or whether we're talking about something as simple as I bet almost everybody here, if not everybody has a cell phone by now. And we didn't used to have those 30, 40 years ago, right? That's adoption of a new technology and farmers adopting these new technologies isn't all that different. There tend to be innovators at the forefront and they are different than your average producer. They're more inclined to take risk. They're more inclined to experiment. They're more inclined to have good solid networks of other innovators and experimenters with whom they share that information and come up with questions and then they just go and do it and they don't really care what anybody else thinks, right? They're just gonna push it at the forefront. And it's not until the innovators start to prove things out that the early adopters start to say, huh, you know, this one guy's doing it and seems to be having success. I'm going to ask them how they do that. And then they start picking it up. Once it's really well proven, then we get our early majority. Um, there's a paper I encountered recently that basically uh, looked at, okay, once you reach about 20% adoption of something, you really start getting a turnover into that majority because it starts to become well established that this is a new way that works better. <laughs> then we get into <laughs> into the late majority, those folks that really want to watch it for a long time, they play it safe, and we might never get to the laggards, right? 
So I'm hoping we can get those first, you know, 80% or so in the next five to 10 years. Gosh, that would be fantastic. That's a big goal. I'm really hoping we can get there. I need everybody to help. We, we all want to do this together. Um, so let's keep working at it. So in terms of the stages of adoption, right, I think, I think many of you will have the biggest opportunities at the awareness stage. Getting somebody aware that these practices are possible and why they might want to adopt. Getting them aware of these differences in healthy soils versus not and helping them have those aha moments. That's the first step. Then somebody can take interest. Then you can connect them with resources if you're not a technical expert yourself and get them really to start trying things out, right? Kind of looking at the ideas, evaluating whether they might want to try that, trying it out on a small piece of land. And it's fairly well understood at this point that producers tend to try something risky on a small piece of land first. They might need to rent equipment or ask their neighbor to come plant the cover crop or whatever. They want to try it in a safe way first. And so um, some of the technical assistance that's needed is to help somebody take those first steps so that they can get used to trying it out on their own so that they can evaluate it and understand how it works on their farm. And then they can take it full scale on their entire um, on their entire operation. So <laughs> we can group those barriers into sort of the social psychological barriers, the technical barriers and the financial barriers. The social and psychological ones are, it often really as a first step requires a paradigm shift. If you've been farming, ranching a certain way your entire life and everybody in your family did it that way, why would you change, right? That, that takes a big step. And some people are more inclined to make that kind of change than others, but it can be a really challenging thing. Um, another issue can be landlord tenant relationships. I don't know how many of you all have situations where you have non-operating landowners and somebody else renting the land. Um, it's really common in the Midwest. I don't know actually how common it is in the Southeast, but when you don't have tenure in the land and the perception, you know, the landlord might think, I want it to look pretty. And what that means to them is they want it to be clean tilled. They don't want the trash in the field, right? That's, that's still commonly used terminology where trash in the field, really what that's referring to is that organic residue that is very valuable, right? It's, it's gold for soil health, but it's been talked about as trash and we talk about clean tilled, right? So there, there are definitely some paradigm shifts that need to happen both on the part of producers and those who own the land that might be renting to a producer. Um, lacking community support, right? Socially, economically, um, there are barriers and miscommunications that happen. And when you go to a coffee shop and everybody does it one, one way, some people are really comfortable being the odd one out, but we're social animals, right? We, we depend on being understood as people and respected as who we are and what we do. And so it can be really difficult if you're in a community where everybody is doing it one way to be that first person to change. So part of what people end up needing is those networks that help them know they're not alone and they have somebody to go to as they're making those changes. Um, recovering from failures, right? If somebody gets bad advice or gets started on the wrong foot in the wrong season and it fails, are they ever going to go back and do it again? You know, some people will, some people won't. And so we really need to help um, early, we need to help those new adopters to have the support that they need so that they know that there's somebody there to help them solve their problems. Um, technical issues, basically a lot of the things that we've talked about today, right? Understanding soil and plant processes and how management can influence that. Um, understanding how to adopt management successfully to really integrate it into the production system really integrating those practices with each other so that the cover crop is adapted to the no-till management, so that the grazing is adapted to now being able to graze a cover crop appropriately, whatever that may be. Um, making sure that all those practices are, adapt are adapted to each other is really important. And knowing how to solve technical failures and problems, again, is a key issue. And then finally, there are financial barriers, and we'll get a lot more into those, so I won't say much here, but there's still not that much information out there on the economic costs and benefits and sort of the risk profile of adopting these practices, but there's starting to be a lot more information and there's a lot of success stories out there. 
um, really capturing that return on investment, knowing ahead of time how to do it, and having a way to, for example, acquire the equipment, the seed, and even the time for learning, right? I mean, those are all in a way economic investments. If a producer is doing the learning, they're not doing something in their field, can they afford that, right? So those are all considerations. Um, markets, you know, if you're trying to bring a new crop to market, that can be a challenge. So just broadly, what are some of the solutions to these barriers just so that we have a little bit of awareness, right? Facilitating paradigm shifts, that really takes building relationships. When producers have relationships with people who have successfully done this or who know people that have successfully done this, they have a lot more of that support that's needed. Having a mentor or some kind of a, a, a network to go to where they can share their successes, they can share their failures, they can get issues resolved, or at least they can get the, the social support of, oh yeah, I ran into that too, that's tricky, isn't it? Um, and, and they can work out those problems together. Having that kind of a support network is really key. And so across much of the country, there's now more and more of an effort to build peer-to-peer -peer networks. Um, the New England team of AFT, for example, has established a farmer consultant program where we got some grant funding to actually pay early adopter farmers to consult with new adopters. So that can be a model where you can bring together farmers of new adopters with somebody who knows a fair bit, who's a technical service provider and kind of have them all adopt at the same time and, and work together with them. So there's starting to be more, more and more of those networks and really making sure that the technical assistance is available um, and that you, you guide people to finding the, the financial assistance that's available that can really help. Um, and then, you know, training on the benefits, the agronomic skills, um, the transitions, how do you do that successfully? connecting producers to all those available resources. A lot of those places are, are um, those are things that you all could potentially add to your soil health impact plans, your soil health action plans. You know, as you start thinking about those, what are some things that a land conservancy type organization can take on, right? Creating those paradigm shifts. You can be that initial awareness bringer, right? You can bring that initial demonstration or bring somebody in. Um, you might be able to just have a set of resources that are available to anybody in, in your county, in your state. Um, so there's a lot of opportunities where you might be able to make a difference with uh, other folks in your area that are working on this. And then moving from awareness to adoption, you know, helping people build those relationships and pursue training opportunities, you know. Uh, bringing them to educational events. If if that's a role that you play, not all of you are in that role, but some of you are involved with field days and with various workshops. And so bringing a producer that might be interested to one of those so that they can experience all the exciting stuff that's out there might be one really good way to go. Um, instigating coffee shop discussions, you know, bring bring a bunch of landowners together over coffee and have them <laughs> have them discuss what some of the opportunities might be um, conducting demonstrations. Um, making equipment available. Um, that's one of the things that has been really successful on especially smaller scale operations to make some equipment available for rental. So a lot of opportunities, again, to achieve this long list of benefits, right? It's, it's worth it. There's a lot of opportunity. There's so much that we can achieve here, but there's that tricky road to adoption. So, you know, Couple of things to remember, adopting soil health management systems is a long-term investment. You know, Doug Peterson talks about two, three, four, five years. If you really go all in and you implement multiple practices, yeah, you can make change fast. Especially, I think in Midwestern, Northeast, to some extent, Southeast systems, you can create change fast because there's plenty of water and plenty of biomass. So you have that opportunity. Um, but some systems take longer than others. And if you dip your toe in very carefully with just one practice, it's going to take longer. And we just need to acknowledge, you know, soil degradation didn't happen overnight. We've been at degrading our soils for a long time. Um, and we want to make sure that we, that we acknowledge that so that people have appropriate expectations. We're going to hear a lot more about the economics of soil health. I want to leave a couple of minutes for folks to ask any more questions. And then we'll have another review session at the end of the day. Right, Chris and Beth? Great, thank you, Bianca. Um, that was terrific. Um, I 
Not sure that I see anybody with their hand up. Does anyone have a question for Bianca? Um, I would note that Celia in the chat noted that partnering with lo local extension offices are a good way to start workshops. That is absolutely the case. We have lots of local partners, um, conservation districts, extension, NRCS, state departments of agriculture now increasingly doing work in this arena, many the other different coalitions. partners. Yeah. 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 